Uh, my name is Simon Stewart, as, as um, you were just told. Um, I'm uh, the tech lead on the WebDriver project, um, which is becoming part of Selenium 2, um, and I'm an active contributor to that. Um, I work with the browser automation team here at Google, um, doing all sorts of fun and interesting things, trying to make browsers actually work um, and make it possible to write, write tests with them. Um, if, you're, if you're on Twitter, my username is shs96c. Um, follow me. I'm getting perilously close to 500 followers, and you know that would be awesome. Um, I might, you know, be happy. Um, I also know that it's really, really close to lunch that we're running late, and you're all desperately hungry. Um, so thank you very much for your continued patience and, you know, listening and stuff like that. Um, please don't heckle too much. Greg. Uh, I'm Greg Dennis. I hope I, everybody can hear me okay. Uh, I'm a software engineer and test on the image search team, and I'm increasingly contributing to the browser automation frameworks of Google. Hello? <laughs> so, I, uh, once again, I'm noisy and you're quiet. Shall we um, start by describing what a front-end test is? It's probably a, a good place to start for a talk entitled The Future of Front-End Testing. Um, Greg. Oh. Okay, I can do it. Yep, not a problem. You can see that we've had a, a long time. Greg works in the Cambridge office. Um, and I work in London, so we don't actually get to meet very often in person. Um, so what's a front-end test? Uh, well, one way to describe it is it's a test against your front-end. Um, now, what's behind that front-end um, is the thing that's quite interesting. So uh, traditionally, these front-end tests are also known as end-to-end -end tests or sometimes integration tests. Um, so you've got the full software stack running, and, and you're testing against that. Um, in other cases, what happens is people stub out or simulate the back ends, and so actually the front end test is running against a fairly slim part of the system. Um, obviously, sort of the, the, the more traditional usage is um, in the in the end to end tests, and that leads to a number of problems. Yeah, and because these tests are so large, our first piece of advice to you is to not write them. If you can get away with it, you should prefer unit tests or system level. Uh, integration tests at the API level. Because they're so large, they depend on so many backends and so many subcomponents. If there is any level of flakiness or brittleness to any of those dependencies, those can bubble up and affect your tests as well. And they're also the least precise tests you can write. Uh, when they fail, they give you the least amount of information about which component is responsible for the failure. But if you do write them, try to follow the patterns we give you in this talk. Yeah, I mean, they're a fairly blunt instrument. Um, so the patterns that we're going to give you uh, in this talk, um, they fall into sort of three broad categories. Um, the first problem that you're going to encounter is social problems, challenges that you as a, as a, as a team can solve. Um, classic examples of social challenges are things like, I don't want to write tests, it's not my responsibility to write tests, I'd love to write tests, but I can't, it's really difficult, you know, um, testing is hard, let's go shopping, things like that. Oh, good. We're going to laugh. Excellent. And uh, the technical challenges we've divided into the ones we believe you can solve, given the right patterns. These include problems like, our tests are too flaky, or our testing code is a mess. Um, and then there's technical challenges that indicate clear shortcomings in the front-end testing tools themselves. Uh, we hear complaints sometimes like, this click event isn't, uh, well, this click wow. event isn't, doesn't seem to be actually clicking the way a user might in this one scenario. Or I'm taking this action, it works fine across most browsers, but it behaves slightly differently in IE6. And we're trying to iron out all those problems, uh, and we'll be telling you about the ongoing work we're doing to do that. Uh, so um, let's start with the social challenges, since we put it first. Um, so these are tips and advice on how to sort of knit your team together get them working effectively, and to address some of those problems to do with, you know, it's not my responsibility, I don't really want to be doing this, um, things like that. First question, who's responsible for testing? Um, anyone want to shout out a couple of suggestions about who, who should be doing all the testing on the, on the product? The, the QA team? Should they be doing all the testing? No, I'm getting shaking of the head. Um, QA team? Not all the testing. The devs, should they be doing all the testing? Well, our answer is you. Uh, and by that, we, mean, we do mean everyone. The entire team has to be involved in this process. 
In particular, it cannot be simply a QA a responsibility. Engineers have to play an integral role. They should be writing many of the tests themselves and contributing to the common test utilities. Uh, if they don't, um, you can wind up in situations where um, the QA team can feel somewhat disempowered and unable to uh, delve deep into the test to find out the issues that may be going on with test failures or test flakiness. And they may not have the insight to figure out, um, not only identify these issues, but to figure out how the application could be made more testable. So um, sort of one of the things, actually, before I move on, story. Um, there was a team uh, uh, that I worked with recently, had the pleasure of working with recently, um, who were being asked to write end-to-end -end tests. And they were going, it's not my job to write end-to-end -end tests. I'm not interested in writing end-to-end -end tests. I've, I've got features to write. Um, and, and this continued for a while. And what was happening was their releases were becoming slower to, to, to release because more manual testing had to be done. Um, and the quality of the product was dropping. And so the test manager on the project turned around to the team and said, when we do a release, if you own a feature that we're releasing, you have to come into the office and you have to be responsible for proving to me that the feature works. And by the way, we may be releasing on a Saturday. And the team went, yeah, there was mutiny, basically. They were deeply, deeply unhappy. Until the test manager turned around and went, of course, that verification, that proof could be automated if you wrote an end-to-end -end test to show that your, product, that your, your feature works, then, then that would be OK. Sure enough, the number of tests that they had sort of skyrocketed almost overnight as everyone realized that Saturdays were a precious commodity that they didn't want to waste. Um, I thought it was a very nice way of sort of engineering sort of the, the social aspects of the team and making people realize that sort of the, the responsibility of testing the application is on the whole team. Um, Boy Scout rule. Has anyone here heard of Uncle Bob? Yeah, in, his, in, in the 97 Things Programmers Should Know um, book, he sort of mentions the Boy Scout rule. And the Boy Scout rule, um, if, if you're a scout, is to leave the campsite um, as clean or cleaner um, than when you arrived. In code, it's like go through your code, clean things up, um, and leave the code base cleaner than, than it was when you arrived. Um, if you're a, an Agile fan, if you're a fan of XP, um, this is the equivalent of sort of going in, noticing a broken window, and fixing it. So cleaning things up as you go along, and taking some, some sort of shared ownership for this code base that, that you all own and have to live in and spend months and months and years in. Uh, another important thing to keep in mind is that tests really only have value when they're trusted. And with such large front-end tests, it can be easy to lose trust. Um, if you have a test, and its pass or fail status is not trusted, you really don't have a test at all. And in fact, you have something worse, because one untrusted, untrusted test can cast doubt or distrust over an entire test suite. So if you find yourself in a position where con you're continually refining a test to remove brittleness, and you can still, you're still unable to, to reach a state where it's trusted, you're often just better off disabling it, deleting it, getting rid of it, um, to, so that it doesn't cast doubt over the entire suite. Um, of course, one of the reasons that people lose trust in their tests is because they're flaky, they're unstable. Um, there are technical challenges that you need to be addressing on your project. Um, fortunately, as well as the internet sock, which is a wonderful invention and very useful on long flights, um, we've got some patterns for you to live by. The first thing that we're going to suggest is end-to-end -end tests tend to be extremely slow. They take a long, long time to run. Um, Nobody wants to sit there and wait while all of your hundreds of tests runs in serial. So you want to be able to run the tests in parallel. You want to run multiple tests at the same time. That has a number of consequences. The first thing is that when you're running a test on your own, and it's a single test, you can, you can make assertions like, make sure there are no accounts, start the thing, start the test. At the end of the test, make sure there's one account present. Um, you can't do that when you're expecting tests to run in parallel. Instead, um, test and, and, and verify for changes in the system that you expect. So rather than saying, make sure that no, the number of accounts has gone up by one, instead say, make sure that this particular account is present because that's the one I created. That means if, if three accounts were created, five were deleted while the test was running, you can verify that, that the test has passed. And you've reduced some of the brittleness in your test case, um, which is sort of one of the major causes that people have of sort of experiencing problems and, and, and flakiness. 
Uh, another cause of brittleness is non-determinism in the web application. Most web applications have some degree of non-determinism, and this can uh, cause headaches when you're trying to test it. Uh, a real-life example um, that I've had to deal with. Let's say you're testing a Google search result page. In particular, you, you want to test the case where there's a single page of search results. Well, how do you go about doing that? Well, through trial and error, you can try to come up with a query that produces a single page of search results, and that might suffice for your test today. Well, of course, tomorrow the index may have grown, and all of a sudden that query is producing two pages of search results. And so you can every so often go back and change the test to adjust for the non-determinism in the web application, uh, but the better solution is to build in hooks into the application to eliminate the non-determinism and make it deterministic. So one of, one of the things we did um, on web search is build a framework where you can save a set of search results to a file effectively and have the test recall that set of search results and force that set of search results when it does a query um, to eliminate the non-determinism. Uh, another example is with CAPTCHAs. Um, a CAPTCHA being one of those little quizzes you fill out to prove you're human, like the distorted image of characters and you type in the correct characters. I fail those all the time. <laughs> Uh, so you may have a login process that has a CAPTCHA in the middle of it. And so how do you go about testing that? It's, it's not feasible to uh, write a test that fills in an arbitrary CAPTCHA. Or if you do, you probably have a Turing award coming to you. Um, so what's necessary is building some sort of hook into the application that maybe forces a predefined CAPTCHA that your test knows the answer to. Um, so el eliminating the non-determinism with, with flags like that for testing is a good idea. Uh, Waiting for state change. This is another pattern for uh, eliminating brittleness in tests. Um, in, in the olden days, or not, not too long ago, it used to be sufficient to wait for a page to load uh, before interacting with elements on the page. With modern apps and AJAX apps where so much is happening asynchronously and so much of the page is changing without any full page load, um, that's no longer the case. Uh, before you interact with an element, you should really make sure that that element is in a correct state and assert that it's in the correct state before interacting with it um, and have the test fail right then and, then and there if it's not. Of course, you don't know exactly when it's going to be in a correct state, so you typically have to wait for that to be the case. Um, and there's both right ways and wrong ways of waiting. The wrong way of waiting is to hard code in uh, sleeps with the, you know, uh, fixed sleep values into the test. So, you know, sleep for one second and then assert that, it, that that element is shown on the page, for example. If you do that, you're building in sort of fundamental flakiness into the test. Um, of course, you could increase that sleep to some arbitrarily large value, uh, and then you've, what you've done is you've eliminated the flakiness, but you've made your entire test suite really slow. Uh, so the real solution there is some sort of busy waiting where you check the condition. If it's true, you continue on. If it's not, you go back to sleep for a small amount of time, and you eventually time out. Uh, now, of course, if you litter your code with all these busy waiting loops, it can become quite a mess. So it's, it's important to make use of uh, the implicit waiting functions that the front-end testing tools make available to you. It, they often have a kind, a kind of wait for condition type function where you pass in an arbitrary condition and it will busy wait for that condition to be true. Yeah. Um, now, these are tips for the test writer. Um, but there's also things that can be done on the application side to make it easier to wait for elements to be in the correct state. Uh, one thing that could be done is to make sure that the UI uh, changes state um, to reflect that elements are now in a state where they can be interacted with. So, for example, if you have a text box you're trying to type into and, you're, and you need to wait for that um, text box to, well, let me give you a different example. Let's say you have a link and you need to wait for an on-click handler to be attached to the link. Um, it's probably a good idea to <clears throat> change the UI state um, once that on-click handler has been attached, both for your user, but for the testing as well. So maybe you don't show the link until the handler has been attached, or maybe you show it grayed out, or maybe you show some sort of loading symbol in the meantime. Um, and the other thing that can happen is, uh, you can do is to um, put hooks in the application, uh, for example, exposing JavaScript variables. It could be as simple as a Boolean flag uh, that you call ready, and you flip ready to true once the application is, is, is ready and the elements are, are uh, able to be interacted with. Um, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I mean, so uh, obviously I know Selenium and, and WebDriver very well. Um, 
WebDriver is, we recently added implicit weights, so you can just sort of wait for the presence of an element and you can make the driver do that for you. Um, it makes the test really easy to read and keeps them nice and clean. Um, both WebDriver and Selenium have a weight interface or class that allows you to do that. I know that other frameworks such as Wartier uh, also support that sort of similar level of functionality, which is kind of useful. Um, hey, this is another one for you. All right. Uh, can I see some ideas? So this, this slide is about separating the, the importance of separating the logical page structure of the page from its presentation. It's a common design principle that we all know about and has other benefits, but it also has, has benefits to testing as well. In particular, if you make judicious use of IDs on your web elements, in particular the, the web elements that um, users are expected to interact with, uh, then those elements are much, it's much easier to locate them efficiently and uh, they're more robust. Um, identifying the element is more robust to changes in the code. Yeah, I mean, um, one of the interesting things that I see with people is they go, they use, mul they use the same ID in multiple places on the page and they go, well, that didn't work. An ID really should be unique. I mean, that's how it's defined in the spec and that's what you ought to be doing. Um, so some teams go to the other extreme and they generate their IDs randomly using a secret that only the, um, the, the application knows and that tests don't know and they go, well, I don't know what the ID is going to be. It's not worth putting an ID on if you're going to do that because you don't know what it is. The sort of key for generating the IDs needs to be a shared secret. So either use clear names that, that you know are going to be there, or if you're generating things, generate the IDs with a sort of regular pattern, um, maybe putting like primary keys or, or a numeric index in there to, to help make things easy. For heaven's sake, don't generate them randomly. It's a really bad idea. Um, of course, sort of all this IDs and stuff like that is, is, is all well and good. Um, and I think Vivek's talk showed us that the problem that we have is people are very key, the, the raw API of your test tool is a daunting thing when you're trying to in, engage the intent of a test. I think we can all agree that. Um, so how do we hide that daunting API and, and make the intent shine through so that someone who looks at your test can go, I know what that's doing. Um, Obviously, this has been mentioned already today, page objects are a very useful pattern for doing that. Um, I always think of them as being like Janus-like objects. You know, Janus, the Roman god with two heads, so January is named after him. Um, he looks both ways. Sort of looking one way, he introspects deeply into the HTML. He knows the structure of the page. He knows how, how everything's hooked together, and he understands um, how, how to do, you know, find a particular element. Looking the other way, um, that he, he presents the services that the page offers to you. Um, you know, in, in Vivek's example, there was sort of the accounts page had the ability to transfer funds and create accounts and, and do all sorts of things. A login page is, is another example. Sort of looking one way, it knows the username and password field. Looking the other way, it offers the service of being able to log in. One of the nice things with page objects and one of the patterns which, which we always encourage people to follow is um, that when you do navigation, you encode that as a return value. So maybe a um, uh, classic example, let's imagine you, you, you're on the Gmail page and we've got like a page object that models Gmail and you're in the inbox and you click on the compose button, that should take you to the compose window, the compose message page. Um, by linking this stuff together, uh, we get to model the, the flow of control through the application. If we change the flow of control through the application, we change the return values of the methods. By changing the return values of the methods, our tests don't even compile. Like, that's the quickest feedback loop you can get. Um, you know, so once you've fixed the, the, the compilation step, then you've got a reasonable confidence that your application is going to work. But page objects are a bit, like, low level, right? You can model components on a page, and you can wrap them together. Taking a step back, you could wire up a series of page objects to model a workflow. So, for example, um, if, if you're creating, uh, testing ads products, maybe you've got a workflow that sort of logs on as, a, as an admin user, creates a new account, um, and then prepares a, a series of test data, and then continues. And you could model that using page objects. But that would be really, really, really painful if you had to do it every time. The UI is phenomenally slow compared to some of the other mechanisms that are, that are available to you. Sorry, I'll just run over my words. Um, but your end-to-end your -end tests don't need to be entirely through the UI you've probably got access to the back-end systems in one way or another. So maybe, sort of, you will have a test that, that verifies that you can create the account data through, through the UI. But in later tests, you replace that workflow with a separate implementation 
that just sort of pokes the correct values in the, in the right place in the database and, and maybe sort of shove something into the LDAP directory and away you go. Um, super, super fast, slims down the, 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 the time that the test takes. And if you're really worried about it, model the workflows as interfaces in, in a language such as Java and then have multiple implementations that you can inject depending on how exciting and how time pressed you're feeling. Um, that's kind of nice. The other thing you can do is at the other end of the test, you can reach into the data stores and you can verify that the data you expect to be there is actually there rather than going to a results page or whatever it is that takes you know, a significant amount of time to load. Like you want your end-to-end -end tests to run as fast as humanly possible. Running them in parallel helps. Doing less work also helps. And it, you really, I mean, this is another example of why it's so important to have engineers in the loop and for it to not just be a QA function. Um, to be able to know how to do that, to interact and test not through the UI requires some sort of insight into the application um, that really only engineers would be able to have. Great. So you've got all these tests and, and, and they run super fast. Um, one of the sort of things that's quite painful is deploying to a production environment, um, even if you, can, if you can get access to it. Um, so what you want to be able to do is you want to be able to take your single suite of tests and as a developer while you're working on a particular feature or story, um, you want to have like a light in-memory version of it that's super fast to start up that you can quickly compile and, and check that your modifications are working. Um, as a member of the, the QA team, you may want to deploy to the UAT environment, the user acceptance testing environment, um, and just make sure that, that the tests continue to pass. And then when you deploy the application to production, um, it would be really nice if you could take that same suite of tests or a subset and run them up against it. So there's a few things that fall out of this. The first one is you really shouldn't be hard coding URLs directly into your tests. That's going to cause um, a lot of pain. Um, another thing that you ought to be doing is, uh, and, and a feature, a, a thing that you see quite often is people will go, I've put IDs in to make testing easy. I'm going to strip them out when I'm going to production. And going, well, why are you stripping it out? And, and sometimes people go, it's for security. Hate it, break it to you, but the botnets in Russia, that's not going to stop them for very long. It's just going to make it harder for you to verify that your application is working the way it should. Another common complaint that people have is, you know, ah, oh, the IDs bloat out my page, um, and I need every single millisecond of latency. Well, if that's the case, try removing um, dead white space that isn't necessary and won't be rendered as multiple spaces. Try GZIP encoding. Um, try doing other mechanisms to make your page smaller rather than removing a really useful hook for verifying that your application actually works. Um, within Google, some of the advice we give teams is to make use of Juiceberry. Has everyone heard of a product called Juice? It's, uh, uh, yeah, that's about half the room. It's um, a inversion of control uh, container. Um, basically, you, you say, I need one of these, and the container is responsible for instantiating one and giving it to you. Um, which is kind of nice. If you make use of Juiceberry, it's easy to swap out the environment that you're testing against. So maybe in one environment, you know, the, 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 the URL for the server is localhost, and another one, it's uat.mycompany.com, whatever it is. Um, but that's a really useful tool for abstracting away sort of the differences behind the different environments that you're going to be running these tests against. Um, of course, when you're running these tests at different scales, Shall I just carry on? Yeah. When you're running the test at different scales, um, data becomes an interesting thing. So let's imagine you're doing a banking app, or actually, you're doing a, a car resale app, uh, like AutoTrader. Um, you probably want to verify, you want to have a test where there's a thing for sale for 500 pounds and you want to make an offer for 400. Brilliant. In the, uh, in, in the lightweight environment, setting up that data is super, super easy. In the Heavyweight production environment, setting up data, you probably need to have a car. So um, one of the things that I haven't seen many teams do, but when they do, it's really effective, is to verify the um, shape of the data that you need. So you say to the test, I want a car that is worth 500 pounds. And in the production environment, it goes, OK, I found one for you here, and gives you a reference to it. In the lightweight environment, saying, I need a car with, that's worth 500 pounds, will actually go and insert that data into the database for you. The assertions on the shape of the data create the data for you in the lightweight tests, and they find it in the heavyweight tests. Um, so you, you've got all that data, in that, and that's brilliant. Um, one of the other problems that we see when we run tests in parallel is that people forget that tests run in parallel. 
Um, so they'll probably use the same, you know, one of the common problems you see is people reusing user accounts. You know, you've got one user account, you've got one admin account, um, and yet you've got three tests running as admin, and suddenly all sorts of craziness is happening in your UI, and you have absolutely no idea what's going on. Um, and the tests are really hard to, to fix, because when you run them on their own, they work. And, uh, you know, when you run them in parallel, sometimes they work, and sometimes they're a bit flaky, and it's really odd. The advice we give to teams is to lock these shared resources. So maybe two tests start that need the admin account. They both go to the, to the, to the service, I need the admin account. One of them gets it, and, and the, the, the service locks that. And when they return the user account, the second test is given it. So they, they're serialized on the, on the shared resources. Um, that will make your tests a lot more stable. Um, obviously, having more than one admin account would also help. Ah, more stuff. Yeah, what the heck, I'll carry on. Um, so sort of that's a, uh, that, that's a sort of advice for test writers. Um, right at the beginning of the talk, we said to people, you know, don't, don't write end-to-end -end tests. They're slow, they're flaky, they're not very good. They are only going to bring you heartache and pain. Um, how, how, do, how do we avoid writing these things? I mean, it, it, it's simply unavoidable, isn't it? Well, a certain number of them are. But um, what, one of the, the, the patterns that you can use, particularly in a modern web application, is um, the model view presenter pattern, MVP, which is a, a variant of, of model view controller, and message buses. Um, MVP is, is similar to model view controller. You've got these three sort of cooperating entities. Um, unlike MVC, the connection between the model and the view is broken. So all access to the view uh, from the model is mediated by the presenter. And whenever the view needs data from the model, it also goes through the presenter. And this allows you to isolate your changes. It's a very common pattern that you see on, on, on applications that are using the Google Web Toolkit, um, GWT. Um, message buses are another mechanism for, for communicating. So um, in a test, what you want to do is you just want to make sure that, that when this thing finishes, it fires a correct event. And you don't really want to wire up all the listeners. You don't really want to know um, that everything else is done. So you want to decouple things as much as possible. Message buses are a really good way of doing this. If you're interested and you want to learn um, a lot more about it, Ray Ryan at Google I.O. in 2008 uh, gave a really good talk on, on exactly this sort of stuff, on writing scalable GWT applications. A lot of the ideas he covers aren't specific to GWT. Um, so I recommend you go and have a, have a watch of that if you've got a spare hour. So uh, we've talked a lot about what you can do differently, and now we're going to talk about some of the problems we're trying to solve. Uh, so first of all, let's say you decide to do front-end testing, and, you, and you're trying to decide on a front-end testing tool to use. Well, that decision isn't very easy. Um, if you look in the open source world, there are some different uh, solutions to choose from. Internal to Google, that question is actually a lot more daunting. We've had kind of a proliferation of front-end testing tools. Um, over the years. And when we've looked across these tools, we've seen that a lot of them are trying to do more or less the same thing. They're trying to load a page in a browser. They're trying to assert that something is shown on the page, or that some text is present, or they're trying to click or type, et cetera. So there's a lot of code duplication, a lot of duplicate effort. And the way we're implementing this is by looking across the, all the front-end testing tools we have and trying to pick out the best practices and, and best implementations of each to really form a sort of best-in-class suite of implementations here. Um, these uh, atoms have already uh, begun to be integrated into uh, Selenium 2, and so they're, in the, they're being built in the open source world, and they're in the uh, Selenium 2 tree. Um, and so the moral of this story is sort of if you have the urge to write your yet another front-end testing tool, um, first don't, uh, but if you really have to, um, please try to at least not reinvent this wheel um, and reuse these atoms and improve the atoms and send us patches, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, writing these, writing these libraries in JavaScript is sort of incredibly tempting, yeah? You know, element has element.focus. I think, ah, I can focus on an element. That should be really easy. Um, you know, some of them have got click. <gasps> that can use, be used to simulate a click. You know, it, it's so tempting to sort of do this stuff yourself. But then you start running into the browser quirks and the differences. Um, we recently checked in a, a browser automation atom to, to focus an element. And it runs to about 20 or 30 lines of code. 
it's, it's a not insignificant amount of effort to make sure that blur and focus actually do blur and focus. It's a terrifying, terrifying thought. Um, as, as Greg said, these are available um, as part of the Selenium 2 tree, which leads us to the next slide. Um, we're working hard on improving sort of the tools that, that we use, WebDriver and Selenium, um, part of the Selenium 2 effort. The atoms are there. Um, one of the interesting things that's sort of starting to occur in the industry is people are realizing um, that doing browser automation is a really, really difficult thing to do. It is quite literally a pain in the ass, uh, mainly because you sit there for hours going, not working, not working, works in that browser. It's not working in i6, though, never mind. Um, you know, it's, it's a difficult thing to do. Um, so one of the things that we're starting to see is some of the frameworks are coalescing on top of using WebDriver as sort of a mechanism for controlling a browser, and then uh, Brett Petticord, the water um, project lead, sort of describes it as innovating in the API space. They're taking the sort of raw tools and they're building far more sophisticated or different APIs that match the requirements and needs of um, different audiences, which I think is, is super, super cool. Um, coming from the other direction, we've got uh, companies like Opera who last year announced the, that they're working on an Opera driver, um, sort of providing these sort of a, a, an implementation of these APIs. And the sort of meeting of the two is kind of fascinating and, and a very exciting place to be. So, leads us into the future. Um, I'm going to talk about the good stuff, and then Greg gets to play bad cop and talk about the bad stuff, because it's not all roses, I'm afraid. Um, as I said, more and more of the frameworks are starting to sort of coalesce on top of WebDriver, um, which is extremely cool, and I'm very happy to have, have WebDriver be turned into a building block for someone who's going to come up with an awesome API. Um, that's fantastic. We're working to try and make WebDriver be exposed from various products. Within Google, we're working with the Chrome team to make sure that that's compatible and works well with WebDriver, working with the Android team for exactly the same thing. In fact, the person who's working, doing the bulk of the work on the Android work is here right now. Um, if you run into Dinia later, shake her hand. She's doing great work. Um, one of the other things that sort of is looming on the horizon is a growing acceptance that accessibility is an important part of a modern operating system and a modern browser. <coughs> this gives us a really nice hook. Um, Apple have recently released a framework called UI Automation, which runs on the iPhone and the iPad and allows you to sort of introspect into the do uh, into the whole of the phone, actually, and do a bunch of interesting things. Uh, Microsoft, with .NET 3, released a library also called UI Auto Automation, which builds on top of their accessibility APIs and provides a, like, a nice C-sharpish interface. Um, uh, ThoughtWorks have released two testing frameworks based on the .NET version, um, White, which lives on CodeFlex, uh, CodePlex, and WhipFlash, which lives on Google Code, um, the latter by Liz Keogh, who's, who's also been involved with uh, behavior-driven development. So sort of the next generation of testing tools is probably going to somehow make use of accessibility APIs. Like these things are, are becoming more and more prevalent. They're becoming um, more and more useful and powerful. And more and more devices are exposing these things. Um, the nice thing is that by making an app testable via the, app, the accessibility APIs, you also make the app available to any disabled user. Now the internet is millions and millions of people. Only a small percentage of them are actually disabled or unable to use like a mouse or a screen. But given the numbers, that's still a vast number of people, and we really should be looking after them. Um, so that's probably what's going to happen in the future. Well, the, the key challenge we face down the road is that web applications are, are becoming increasingly complex and involving more and more technologies. Um, we already have HTML5 uh, being supported by some modern browsers, um, and we're seeing integrations of uh, non-HTML components like Flash and Silverlight and Air into the web app. And, and that's really, our, you know, in that area, the increasing complexity of web applications is, is the main challenge going forward, I think. Yeah, that, that sort of integration of Flash and Flex and stuff like that in Silverlight is, it always used to be fairly brutal. It was either all Flash or all HTML. And nowadays, we're sort of seeing nicely blended approaches. Um, things like uh, Google Analytics have have like charts with timelines on. And those timelines are, are generally done in Flash. But some of the other charts are rendered images and, and, and things like that. File so, upload. Yeah, file uploads, that's, that's a terrifyingly complex thing to do. Um, I think uh, Gmail supports file uploads by the normal file upload button. You can drag and drop from the desktop, or I don't know, maybe that's possible. You could certainly do that in Wave. Um, 
and also there's sort of flash uploaders that are available. So there's like three ways of uploading content, and you probably want to test all of them. Um, so APIs and things that need to be developed for that. Now, it took us 10 years to do that for simple HTML. Um, I expect there to be a lot of churn and, and, and iterations going on as, as the sort of the brave new world of HTML5 engulfs us completely. OK. I think we've got to the question stage. I think that because there's a big slide saying any questions. Um, so are there any questions? Hi. This is a nice idea. Uh, the basically, what I'm looking for is the, the flash objects. Flash objects. Yep. So suppose if you have some moving text, it's are out. So how does uh, get vision text work on? Um, so it, that, that's basically a question of like, how can you use? Um, yes. Yeah. OK. So one of the interesting things that, that we're seeing is that no single tool can meet every single need. Um, okay. It seems like a really obvious thing to say, but it needs to be said sometimes because you know, we've got a golden hammer, and by God, we're going to hit everything that looks nail-like, including our own feet. Um, you know, it's going to be fun. Maybe that should be a golden gun or a silver bullet. I don't know. Um, the point is, however, that we're starting to see libraries interoperate a lot better. Um, the classic example is Selenium and WebDriver. There's a project called FlexMonkey or FlexPilot. There, there are two, two projects um, that sort of play nicely, and you can use them in conjunction um, with, with Selenium. Okay. Um, so you've got this sort of blended approach. Um, at the other end of the scale, people sort of go, oh, I want to have far more information about the HTTP headers, and I want to have a look at the traffic, and I want timing information and stuff like that. Um, that's ideally solved by putting a proxy in the middle that measures this stuff for you, and then you can query the proxy programmatically. That's starting to come. Um, BrowserMob, a company set up by Patrick Lightbody, um, have a project, proxy.browsermob.com. That's an open source proxy container that provides and, and, and has that information. Um, there's also the Web Timings API, which is starting to be supported in the major browsers, which gives you far more precise timing than hey, look, the onload event fired, and my framework happened to catch it at some point. So I think we're going to see a, a sort of blended approach of, of tooling. Fine. Does that answer the question? Yes, yes. Brilliant. And one more question is, like, uh, the dynamic hyperlink. Dynamic hyperlink concept. Dynamic like, hyperlink. Yes. Uh, when you click on, uh, like, for example, if you have a times page, uh, every day we'll be finding some different contents on the uh, hyperlink. So how the click options just works on that? Uh, so one of the things that we've been working with on, on WebDriver in particular is this sort of concept we call native events. So um, what would happen if a user clicked on that link is, is the question we always ask ourselves. Yes. Um, so sort of the, the browser automation atoms have an implementation of click that does as good a job as, as we can do. Um, but native events sort of push that up a level. What we do is we identify where in the window that particular element that we're clicking on is, and then we send um, OS level events directly to, to, the, to those coordinates, um, simulating a click at the OS level. And then we don't need to know what order events fire and whether or not a particular key code is set or not. We let the browser handle the things it needs to do. By doing that, we've decoupled ourselves slightly from the browser, so your tests become a little more asynchronous. So that slide about waiting for things to happen becomes really important. Like, wait for the next element you want to interact with to be in the state it needs to be in, um, because otherwise your tests are going to display a certain amount of brittleness and flakiness. Cool. Are there any other questions from around the room? Uh, just a uh, thing about the IDs. Uh, 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 based on my experience, uh, we were doing my testing and everything, and we found that uh, you know, some uh, didn't put the IDs. And when we raise it up, I say, you know, it's still OK, because you can still use get element by name and get you know, things running that way. So how do you approach that in that sense? Uh, so the nice thing with, sorry, do you want to answer this, Greg, or shall I? OK, cool. Um, the nice thing with IDs is that in many, in many browsers, the lookup time is linear, or constant, even. Um, you can find the elements very quickly. The exception are older versions of IE, where we see really weird timing behavior. So if you have Lots and lots of different IDs. It slows down significantly. Um, so like IDs are the fastest, and we recommend that just because it's so quick. Finding elements by name, that's actually pretty quick as well, particularly if you know that a name is unique on a page, because the browser has a mechanism for providing that information. 
The next quickest way of finding elements is via CSS selectors. So particularly the modern browsers have native implementations that are blazingly fast for locating elements via CSS. The slowest way and, and the most brittle and the way that you really, 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 really shouldn't be using, even though it looks really nice and you really shouldn't be using it, is with XPath. Did I make it clear you really shouldn't be using XPaths? They're incredibly brittle. Um, I know they can be made to work. You'll just have a lot of pain if you try it. Um, the reason why XPath is slow is because um, particularly IE doesn't have a native XPath engine. And so we need to write that XPath engine. And we import one written in JavaScript. Um, sadly, the JavaScript engine in older versions of IE is the slowest one of, of the available browsers. And so we're doing a particularly large lookup on a complex DOM using a slow uh, JavaScript engine. And people go, well, it doesn't perform very well. The other thing as well is that people sort of tend to get really, really sophisticated with their XPaths. You sort of see dot contains and class names, and they go up the descendant tree and the ancestor tree, and it's all tremendously complex. Um, that's the sort of thing that just identifies differences in different XPath engines. Um, so you may get inconsistent results. Um, so IDs, names, CSS selectors, they're, they're the daddy. Uh, is there anyone else? I'm uh, really interested in hearing what you didn't say about the impact of HTML5 at the end on where you think the automation tools and drivers will need to go. Uh, do you want to have a stab at answering this, Greg, or shall I continue banging away speaking? I, I, I mean, I don't have too much to say here other than it, it's, it's merely an area where I, I haven't investigated yet. Um, there, are new, there are new DOM elements, there are new actions you can expect the user to take, and whether or not we can uh, simulate those events with fidelity is the open question and, and the challenge that we need to solve. I don't know if you have any more Yeah, th I mean, the thing that terrifies me the most is the canvas element. Um, it's, seeing, it's already seeing pretty heavy adoption. Um, and the problem is that people are doing a lot of their own work in the canvas element. And as far as automation tools are concerned, it's just a rectangle on the screen. We just have no mechanisms for introspecting into it. I think what we're going to need to do, if we're going to automate that successfully, is have help from the development teams. Like People need to be aware that it's not enough just to make fancy things happen on that. You need to provide hooks to allow um, an automation tool to actually get in there and, and figure out what's going on. Um, this is one of the reasons why I think sort of accessibility is going to be important. Um, I think sort of anyone who's doing a, an app that uses a lot of the canvas element should be making a real effort to make sure it's still accessible in the same way that people doing complex app, uh, websites using Flash should be trying to make it accessible. Um, and those hooks are going to be the hooks that we're going to have to take advantage of in order to be truly effective as, as sort of browser automation vendors and, and people working in that space. Um, obviously, video is a fascinating area, but I don't think people test it in quite the same way uh, just because of the visual nature of it tends to require a person to, to be involved. Does that answer the question, by the way? Well, sort of. I mean, I think all the things you alluded to in Flash that are difficult will increase 10x. Perhaps. Um, I'm, I, I'm vaguely optimistic for the future. Um, I think we've had so many years just getting people used to the fact that they can do test-driven development of their application. Like Selenium has been around for, what, six, seven years now. WebDriver has been around for about four. Um, you know, other tools have, have been around for a similar li uh, lifetimes. Um, if you have something, if you've never had something and someone takes it away, you don't notice. Like, but now that people are used to having this ability, if we suddenly took it away, there's going to be upset and hurt. Um, like, there's no way that I'd want to work on a project that deliberately makes itself untestable. Um, so I'm feeling vaguely optimistic, but I think there are some engineering challenges that we're going to have to meet in order to effectively solve these problems. Um, yeah, it's, it, but it's going to be interesting, and it has the potential to be horrific. <laughs> there we go. That's a dystopic view. It's going to be horrible. Hi, uh, this is Kunal here. Uh, so I wanted to know the two uh, portions which were not really discussed in this presentation. One was regarding localization. So uh, are any elements or anything being done in this, uh, in this initiative or certain, like how you've shown 
what uh, uh, code controllability or uh, observability being implemented. Are anything being done for that aspect? And the second part, again, is that browser compatibility. As multiple browsers coming in, we are running multiple uh, iterations of the same test. So if anything is being done or being implemented for the same. I can take a stab at the localization part of the question. Um, uh, one of the things we mentioned in the, in the talk was the importance of separating the structure of the page from its presentation. And sometimes in the tests we see, if people lack IDs or lack names or even CSS selectors to identify an element, they'll start identifying the element by the actual text that it shows, you know, click on the button that says submit. Now, of course, that is not going to localize, and uh, um, it'll be called something else in some other language. And so just to emphasize the importance of uh, separating the structure of the page from presentation will help with the localization. And um, one of the other patterns we mentioned was the you know, page object pattern and, and abstracting these common test utilities into, um, into, into objects and classes that the test share. So the extent that we can factor out the work of the internationalization into page objects and other utilities that the test reuse will, will help there. So one of the funniest problems that I heard of for a long time, um, a team was, was internationalizing their application. Um, and their IDs were internationalized as well. So their, their tests ran flawlessly in English, but broke horribly uh, when done in French or Swedish or, or whatever it was. It was like, it took me a while to figure out what was going on there. And then I had a quiet word with them and went, you don't need to internationalize the IDs. It'll be OK. Um, so th some of the other stuff that's happening, um, particularly around localization, people are building tools on top of these basic building blocks. Um, you know, there's, uh, there's a, at least, so Michael Tam, um, last year at GTAC, gave a great presentation around sort of um, detecting visual bugs and issues using WebDriver. Um, and that's very useful for his work um, as he translates things, uh, as his site goes from English into German. Um, Germans are far more verbose language than, than English, um, particularly when written. And so sort of it's quite common for, for buttons to overlap parts of the UI they're not. Um, so there's things like that. It would also be possible to write tools to detect right to left issues. So if you're going into an Arabic or, a, or a, 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 you know, any, any other Israeli um, right to left language, um, then you, know, you, could, you might be able to detect those um, automatically. But the, the base tools are there now, and, and they can provide you with a lot of information. That it's, it's up to the teams who are trying to identify these issues to sort of start building the more sophisticated tools on top of it. And as we become more familiar in OFE with what it is that we're attempting to do, there's going to be strands of commonality that are going to appear. Um, and when they appear, then we're going to see more general tools becoming available. Does that help? Brilliant. Uh, so uh, Simon, uh, probably, uh, I don't know whether it's the right uh, forum to ask this question. <laughs> Uh, say one of the common challenges uh, with Selenium, probably with many open sources, uh, if I'm right, is towards, um, yes, WebDriver is going to address the configuration problems of all these web browsers, but uh, even the environment in which you work, say, for example, J um, uh, Java, say, for example, with, with what is a version of Selenium, what you could work with some version of Java, plus all these challenges which are coming in. Uh, one, um, if I have to compare it with uh, another open source project like Bugzilla or something like that, there's a huge development forum which supports this whole initiative and like, you know, uh, at least there is a big forum to test it out and tell and say, uh, like, you know, manage these problems. Uh, if I have to take the, take Selenium to some extent, even though everyone talk about it, everyone use it extensively, but um, for some reason I don't see a great forum which would solve these problems. There are big forums to ask questions, very small forum to like, you know, solve this. Um, is there any uh, uh, thoughts which happen from your side or Google in terms of how we would uh, address this or like, you know, because uh, most of the open sources are some of the open sources which doesn't fly very well, even though they had a great feature because not having a great forum. Right. So, so uh, considering that, uh, uh, I know it, it, uh, it might be uh, it, it not so technical, but um, being a user of Selenium, I just want to see this uh, having a much longer life, then yeah. uh, uh, that's the perspective which I want to uh, ask from you. 
Okay, so um, I heard a, a question there more about the sort of social dynamics of an open source project and how you manage to support it. Um, so there's a, a number of, of interesting things that you can do um, in order to run sort of a vibrant open source project rather than one that's sort of moribund. Um, with Selenium, what we've got is we've got a developers list where the people who are working on the framework itself hang out and they discuss issues like, should this API be doing this? What about this? Um, things like that. That's an open list that anyone can, can join, anyone can read, anyone can post to. Um, you know, we're, we're not fussy. There's a Selenium users list as well, which is hosted on Google Groups, um, which is a great forum for asking questions. Now, the volume of traffic on that is pretty high. Um, but it, it, there are, you know, some of the, some of the core contributors um, do monitor that list, and some of them occasionally sort of swoop in and help where it's appropriate. Um, we've got the Selenium HQ site, which provides at seleniumhq.org, which provides the official documentation. Um, we've, there's a team of volunteers who have spent a lot of effort making sure that documentation reads well, um, is comprehensible, provides the information that people commonly need. And you will occasionally see exceptions being thrown that point you toward, from the, from the, from the Selenium project, that point you towards various areas of that site to go, you've run into a problem, we've documented what that problem is, and you can address it there. Um, there was also a move a while ago for a Selenium Stack Exchange site. So um, I would imagine that would be a bit more focused than the users list, which is a bit of a free-for-all, um, and, and would, would help, for, help provide some of that information. Um, while that's being set up, I mean, Stack Exchange itself is a, is a good place to go for help. I know that various members of the core team do hang out on Stack Exchange and do answer some of the questions. Um, so in answer to the question, how do you keep the project sort of alive and vibrant? I think the people who are working on it need to be visible and they need to be interacting with that community and they need to be finding out how people are using the tool so they can keep on making sure it's fit for purpose. Like it's so easy, like Joel Spolsky talks about software architecture astronauts, astronauts, astronauts. Um, you know, people who are so far removed from the thing they're trying to solve that they don't solve anything. Um, you know, it, there's always a danger of that, but I think sort of staying in touch with teams and watching what people are doing and the problems they're running into is a really good way of making sure the project is a good fit. If the project is a good fit, it becomes more popular and it's a, it's a virtuous circle. Um, the other thing is providing a forum where users can ask questions and help each other, and we provide that forum through, through mailing lists. Um, now, obviously, these advice, the, the, this is sort of the Selenium example. I can imagine open source projects doing something very similar. I know Water's got um, <clears throat> something extremely similar. Uh, they also have a, a regular podcast where they sort of discuss things that are going on in the community. That's a nice way of sort of keeping people updated. Does that answer the question? Yeah, we can talk afterward if you'd like. Brilliant. Ankit is giving me the nod that maybe I've talked for far too long. Um, hmm? Yeah, I mean, I'm lucky. I'm probably taller than Ankit, which is the only reason why he doesn't do it. Um, thank you all very much for your attention. I know thank you. that we both appreciate it.